Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Folks, we'll go ahead and get started here. We'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I've got a couple of announcements so people can keep, uh, keep coming in and getting settled while we're going, and then I'll introduce our guests and we'll be underway. Uh, first and foremost, if you haven't yet signed in on our computer in the back for craft teaching credit, please do so. That goes on that in the end of our system. Um, I have a couple of announcements about upcoming craft teaching events. Um, this coming Friday, May 1st, 9 to 5, uh, all day long, this is colloquium, right here in the District Hall Common Room on Introducing Religion, uh, at which our faculty from all stripes uh, will um, we'll come together and um, and we a conversation on the problems, the challenges, the possibilities of introducing religion uh, at the undergraduate level, a running theme that we've had going on uh, much of this year. Um, following that, we have a series of several arts of teaching events. So if you haven't finished your arts of teaching requirement, this is um, this course is a great opportunity to do so. We have uh, three upcoming events. Please check our, our website for the specific details, but I just want to call your attention in particular to our micro-teaching workshop, which affords an opportunity to um, engage with uh, 10 minutes of hard uh, teaching and followed by video feedback and, and community feedback. So that's a great opportunity uh, if you need arts of teaching with Many thanks to the Martin Marty Center for co-hosting this event. I'm just delighted to welcome Professor Martin Marty uh, here today. Professor Marty is the Fairfax and Cohen Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of the History of Modern Christianity. Uh, he taught at the University of Chicago from 1963 to 1998, focusing primarily on American religious history, but with horizons of interest and insight uh, stretching uh, into global ecumenical issues, both, uh, both interreligious and interreligious. Um, listing his accomplishments here would be Sisyphean, which nobody wants, particularly non Sisyphus. So I won't try. Um, instead, suffice to say that Professor Marty has published over 50 books, advised over 100 doctoral students, and has remained for decades as one of our most prominent interpreters of religion, culture, and public affairs. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mark Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Does this sound all right? Yeah. I don't think it's on. <laughs> and you're free money. Is it Yes, it's good time. You know I've heard you talk about stuff like that. Thanks for inviting me. It's really great to be here. On the first day, it looks like it's supposed to look in spring on the campus, so I took a walk. For all time's sake. Uh, one innovation for seminars like this, you had to check in at the computer and I did it. <laughs> but I was going to illustrate with a point here. Pearls Before Swine. you ever see it? Uh, you can Google it, Pearls Before Swine. This is January 11th. It's an armadillo, a rat, a goat, and a pig. And sometimes a human being, the cartoons. And armadillo says, Hey, Dad, did you get the Ken Burns Civil War DVD I sent you for your birthday? And I said, Yeah. What do I do with it? You put in the DVD player, I got you. Where? In the little tray. What tray? We don't create a DVD player. <laughs> well, where, where, which one's the DVD player? <laughs> On top of the TV set. Great. Okay. Okay. Give me a minute, will you? There. Okay. Got it in. And now I'm watching some explosion. Good. You're watching Civil War? No, no. The TV explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and the advice at the end is never give your parents anything invented in the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. The agenda morphed a little bit. It was originally with the kind of generic discussion of uh, communicating in the face of change in mass communications, and it moved now a bit more to an example of it, namely polarization, which we'll get to if we're going to get to. Uh, we're starting with a broader scope. It says, reflecting on a lifetime of public, 
It only supposed to reflect on a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> it's not done yet. <laughs> puzzled by the Schopenhauer said you spend the first half of your life living and the second half of your life interpreting it. And I never figured out when it's half over. <laughs> 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 um, but all the public engagements, in my case, is probably the case of all of you who have any such or will, is largely accidental. Uh, I never planned it. I never would have known what they meant by it or anything like that. I grew up in a town that had fewer people than the building I now live in has. And uh, a son of the prairies, I uh, built it over here. Uh, but somehow early on, I got invited into it and pushed into it. I got curious today, and I looked up in 1963, I did a book called Second Opinion, no, no, Improper Opinion, uh, on Christian communication and mass media. And it was based on a poem of W.H. Auden called The Proper Citizen. He held the proper opinions for the time of the year. When there was peace, he was for peace. When there was war, he went. And I was trying to ask how you could communicate in such a way that you run against some of that and, and uh, alert people. And then a book came out. They just invented triface that year, 1963. Uh, Arthur Hertzberg, um, and senior John Moody, and I did a book called The Outbursts That Await Us. And uh, it couldn't have been a better time. We didn't know that. We assigned it. Because we were just coming off the no, or 50s. Uh, things were booming. And the outbursts that await us. And there they came. Uh, the racial change came. The Vietnam protests came. Uh, I remember teaching a course in here with uh, that I was done in English and Joseph or the theologian. And there they all were, a, a, a host encamped against us. We had a big debate as to where the lectern should be and whether they should sit or stand, etc. <laughs> and I still went in, David Carrasco. Mm -hmm. It was all last week. They brought a lot to this place on public engagement. All of a sudden we had learned that you couldn't be just in the archives and I like them. Um, in teaching, I don't think the subject you asked me to talk about today is something you can quite teach. You can teach some things about it. You can't teach it. I think you, you pick a profession or it picks you, a vocation. Uh, when I retired, they asked whether I wanted to be remembered as, and I listed five, six things, and I said, teacher. Uh, yeah, writing is fun. Uh, I was a minister, that was fun. All these things are fun. But I don't know any transaction that's more fun than teaching. And I'm um, glad you're doing This is art or craft? Craft of teaching. You said art? We have, yeah, we have the arts of teaching track and then mm -hmm. more electives and more cool. discussion <laughs> styles. I think you're a craft. I'm still with them. Um, <laughs> well, accidental. One more accidental thing and then I'll get on to it. How I got here was accidental. Somebody that made all this story. Uh, I went to a theological seminary and co-invented Franz Bidfeld, who was known around here. <laughs> Forbidden by Harry, who couldn't come for going into that because it takes up the afternoon. <laughs> but half the faculty was really angry when it, when it, when it, when it was exposed. And they would come up to a faculty member and say, what do you think of Franz Bidfeld's new commentary in 2 Corinthians? And they thought, <laughs> I like his career work. He <laughs> <laughs> made enemies, and they're going to throw me out six months before a nation. I appealed to higher authority, the president of the school, a fixer. We wondered how we could afford a time of stick pin and all that stuff. And we figured out that Cardinal Ritter of St. Louis got tired of burying the mafia, and he turned on some over this Lutheran buddy, and that's how we got into it. I went to his house at 10 at night. He had on a smoking jacket. I didn't even know what they are. <laughs> 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 they have a satin and stuff like that. Yeah. In front of the fire, he had my second cigar of the evening. Mr. Marty, I know you're in real trouble. Yeah, they decided you are too immature and irresponsible to represent us in London as you were supposed to. They say you need seasoning. Yes, sir. 
to head and they sent me a wonderful place, Lace Luther and River Forest. But as I left, we have two questions. One question. It's like a satire on all us or on one of us. Yes, uh -huh. us. He said, I really knew that, but I had to hear it from you. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this fine theologian, fine pastor, fine reverend guy, put his arm on me, said, I just want to say one thing, young man. This was the funniest damn thing that happened since I've been president here. <laughs> <laughs> And part of that call was the assistant pastor had to do graduate work, and so that's how I ended up doing graduate work here. <laughs> Teaching, quickly, because I think I'm kind of making a point that public engagement for people who graduate from a place like this has to begin with teaching and has to be defined in teaching. In a lot of ways, I don't even like the word public intellectual, I like the word public scholar. Public intellectual, nothing wrong with it, but you depend on entrepreneur, you're passionate, whatever the market needs. If you're a public scholar, you're going to be measured by whether you know something about what you're certified to know something about. And I can't stress strong enough that that was it. But uh, I lucked out in that my three advisors all were public scholars. My advisor, Sidney Mead, wrote elegant essays, still read, if you've ever read, Mr. Gamble, you've had to read Sidney Mead. <laughs> elegant essays on Emerson or William James or someone. And uh, he had all the students devote ourselves to that. Second, even more so for me, was uh, Daniel Borston, who was uh, in the history department, later librarian of Congress. Ended up one of the neocon intellectuals along the way, but mm -hmm. I knew him before he fell on the scent. A marvelous teacher. And he fought the notion that to be intellectually productive, you had to be arcane and turgid and sick. One of our paper had unnecessary footnotes, <laughs> they're all out. He did three volumes on American history and no footnotes. Mm. But you can't read it without knowing there's no scholarship in it. That was it. As I say, he became librarian of Congress. Uh, one quarter I was in his course, and he was trying to prove that every book in the colonies had to have been imported in the 17th century. And to make that point, he had to prove that there were no ink factories and no Pumping up paper places, so every book had to be important. And oh man, I spent time in, at that time it was Harper. Oh, I just went through everything looking at looking. Couldn't find anything, so I reported back. I thought, I'm going to get a nice footnote. <laughs> this went on. Of course, as everyone knows, there were no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but all our eyes, anytime we were a little spooked out about this, I was then feeling you can tell whether it's scholarly or not. And I love footnotes, but they have to be there for a reason that I do it with more things. And then Gerald Brower, who brought me here as dean, and the uh, rest of the <laughs> I was getting kicked out. Uh, he didn't publish much, but boy did he teach. I think yeah. he would testify to that. Yeah. He, he taught a real love for the act of teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a bad reputation of having 15 and I lived on, on student visits because we had a lot of hurry. But it was always two hours of the power, because he would be sure that you got his same purism. <laughs> <laughs> what I've really described is how I fell into all of these things. And my life model I got from Eugen Rosenstock Pussy. Uh, I don't quote him often in my speeches because I'm limited to 50 minutes. Rosenstock <laughs> <laughs> Pussy takes a lot of time. <laughs> And he was, uh, 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 he and Franz Rosenzweig, the greatest Jewish scholar of the last century, my most, well, all men of scores, right? On him. Uh, they both uh, were secular Jews, walked into a synagogue one day, and it began the reaffirmation of Judaism for Rosenzweig. And uh, Rosenzweig, he kind of always tried to bridge the two along the way, affirmation of both. It's a little complex, but if you know Henry, it my complexity. He argues that the act of teaching and learning in the West could be summarized in three Latin phrases. Credo ut intelligam, 
I believe in order that I may understand that was the truth is divine and in origin. Then in the enlightenment, uh to ergo sum, I think therefore I am in the celebration of reason. But he said, right in nineteen seventeen, having witnessed World War One, yes, we keep getting good inventions, we have a century of good learning, and then issues in poison gas, mustard gas, machine gun, etc. We have to restore the human to this, and his life motto, the one I picked up, is respondio esse mutabor. I respond, although I will be changed. I hope that along the way uh, we're finding things that invite response, but when you respond, you can't keep doing what you had planned to do. My other scholar that I'll mention is. Oh, the name is almost as complex. Jose Ortega de the great Spanish philosopher. Because I'm going to now lead into what is the subject matter of all of our studies in a way. Carl, Carl J. Weintraub, Jock Weintraub, uh, Man of Humanities, here for a long time, wrote a book called Visions of Culture. And his chapter on Ortega gave me a lot of clues. What is it we're after? If we want a fresh public engagement, what is the public? And we gave you some readings on public. But what is the engagement like? And I'm going to quote him about 15 lines here. I apologize for him having been born too soon. He always used the word man when he meant human being, but I'm say kind of old, say sick all the time. <laughs> man is that which has happened to him. What he has made. Other things could have happened to him. He might have made other things, but that which actually happened to him, and that which he actually made, presents an unchangeable line of experience which he carries on his back as the vagabond carries his possessions. The human is the pilgrim of his being. He is substantially a wanderer. There is only one fixed line that is determined and given before him which can orient or direct us to pass the experience which the human has made to limit his future. I think that's, whether you're in history of religious study, whether you're in psychology, or religion, I don't care what it is, if you want to communicate, you have to analyze your own and see what others are. The individual cannot get his bearings in the universe except through his race, which he meant a historical nature of interpreting reality, because he's immersed in it like a drop of water in a passing cloud. So we have to certainly deal with the world, I don't remember the word world, I'm coming back to it, to turn toward it, to act with it, to be occupied with it. Hence, it is literally impossible for the human to renounce the attempt to possess a complete idea of the world, an integral idea of the universe, be it cruel or refined, without consent or without it, the trans scientific picture of the world is embodied in every spirit. It comes to cover our existence much more efficiently than the scientific truth. I'm reading a review of uh, the new biography of Albert Einstein in the New York Review of Books, this issue. Boy, did he know that. The supreme scientist of his century. But he knew that the world is embodied in every spirit. It comes to govern our existence much more effectively than the scientific truth. So world. Uh, when I meet somebody new, I never ask them, what do you do? Well, of course, what is your work? I hang out with retired people, it's embarrassing. What is the work? I was asked, what is your world? What do you mean by your world? Well, I say, this, what are the things that turn you on? What do you Almost never is it defined by how they make their living. They'll do something about their living, but they don't start with that. Oh, my world, oh boy, I love classical music, or I made the jazz, or uh, comics, <laughs> or whatever. It gives you a little clue, and pretty soon it strings out into all the things that they connect. That's what Ortega was after, and that's what you respond to. Culture, said Ortega, are the organs which succeed in grasping a small piece of the absolute yonder. Culture is the repertory of op solutions which people advance in response to the problems of their lives. Ortega, it's the conception of the world or the universe which serves as the plan 
recently elaborated by humans for orienting themselves among things, for coping with their lives, and for finding direction in the chaos of their situations. Culture is only the interpretation which the human gives to his life, a series of more or less satisfying solutions which he finds in order to meet the problems and amid the chaos of life. Finally, and I promise you no more than back to Ortega, what happens in the world you're living in, I'm living in, I think we began to feel we were living in around the 1960s. Uh, but I never mean anybody young who doesn't live in this one. A historical crisis exists when the modification of the world is such that the world or the system of convictions of the preceding generation is followed by a situation in which the human is without the convictions, therefore without a world. It's a modification which at first is negative, critical. In ages of crisis, one finds frequently false and hypocritical opinions, 1963. Whole generations falsify themselves, that is, they escape into artificial styles, into doctrines, into insincere political movements, merely to the emptiness left behind by genuine convictions. And if we want to communicate in this world, we have to try to discern what are the worlds of the readers and the listeners. And they're very different from each other. You can't make one great generalization. I did a couple of my talk about 1963. There were a lot of 1963s out there. You pursued what you did. What was your world? Well, these 60 students in here said, you've got to be relevant. That was easy for us if we were teaching about the 60s. We didn't know anything about it. We just talk. But what do you do if you were Robert Grant teaching about early Christianity? Or worse, uh, or an institute, prosecutor book, Sanskritology, and so on? We were all do a course on our world. And uh, they told us it would be best if we talk about the city. Well, that was easy for us, we call on a city. Robert Grant, he still had Rome and things to talk about. Hans Peter Bach, Sanskrit, though. And so, Grant uh, had, of course, a very Christian world. Peter Bach tried it in the Sanskrit. After a while, the students came, please, Professor Grant, you used to be real interesting. <laughs> you're trying to be relevant. Why? Because you're trying to be at home in our world and we're not there. We want you to interpret these worlds, but you can't pretend that you're there the way we are who live here, or like the scholars who really read it. So we live in these multiple worlds, and the study of both of culture and religion is part of it along the way. The part of the assignment was I was supposed to discuss strategies for activities, <coughs> and I think the only strategy I've had so far is pay attention to your teachers and become one and be alert to the world that they're in and you're in and your subject matter. Hans Peterbach was the most charming lecturer about worlds far remote from us. He was in a bunch of people at Oriental Institute who spent how many years and how many million dollars on an Assyrian dictionary. Mm-hmm. One of them came over here from Vienna to uh, proofread the letter Schwa. Help me out. Is there mm-hmm. a sense of thing? Schwa. It's a... Yeah. Right, it's a dollar. I don't hate those. So. And they, one of the volumes is that. Mm-hmm. And he came from Leipzig to interpret it. And uh, I was going to Leipzig in 1983, which was, as every true historian of the faith would know, the 500th of Martin Luther's birthday. <laughs> so there we were in Soviet ties, East Germany, trying to penetrate to this other world. It was, it was really a, a culture I had learned. You couldn't even engage the waiter in light talk because they knew everything could be recorded. You knew your minister might well be part of a Stasi. It was, it was just absolutely But Professor Ilser was his name, O-E-L-S-N-E-R, said, you know, my wife and I have a daughter, confirmation age, but she can't go to confirmation because she, uh, won't join the party. But would you take this $500 to them? Well, 
I'm a little boy from Nebraska, a little country guy from Chicago, and I'm going to smuggle 500 bucks in the Stasi land. Oh, no, it's perfectly legal, it's just complex. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you do, don't telephone her. Go to Thomas Kirche, Bach's church, and ask for Pastor Abeling. He came outside, we never meet in words if you're doing stuff, meet outside, and I told him what I wanted. And he said, uh, I'll be back. And he was back, he said, at 8 o'clock tonight, be at the fountain and write this square. And my wife will be there to pick you up to take you to our home. Because we know that our home has been debunked and you'll be safe there. I had a little Toby. She drove half an hour, didn't say a word. And I thought, and I'm not going to have with this. <laughs> We got there, we see her daughter hopped out. Like all the buildings there was veiled. Very, very. We walked up three flights. She opened the door and she said, this is this year's bottle of wine. This is this year's daffodil. This is this year's candle. And you are this year's guest. Let's have a party. <laughs> <laughs> and we could talk about anything because we're the bugs along the way. Well, here I'm moving from the world of Chicago I dare not assume it to the world of Martin Luther, which I didn't dare assume was a little closer, or the world of Bach, which was still closer. I seek for Bach. I spoke at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for the 100th anniversary of the Bethlehem Bach Festival, and they wanted to be in you know, a Moravian church. They wanted to be as authentic as possible. So I started by saying, yeah, on the way over here, we stopped at Sternberg. <coughs> Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> we bought their two girls together along the way. Uh, some people can do this with uh, PowerPoint. It's really a wonderful instrument for the arts, for many kinds of things. It never worked for the kind of thing I did. And I hung out with people who said, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so we were talking about words. But what I'm trying to do all through this is celebrate teaching. That's what else, his wife who taught us so much in that long way. And uh, that's background. It's been oh, I over three minutes. I went over three minutes. Over three. <laughs> it's a lot of 40. Uh, it's your turn. <clears throat> Let's, let's set the agenda now for what you want to talk about, and we can always be guided by the, the main readings, uh, which had to do with the character of the public we're talking about. This is not how you use the devices, a PowerPoint. I welcome them when people know how to do them. Uh, how do we analyze what is a public? How do we get into it? How do we communicate? And I think the word in the first assignment was to wider publics. Four things on the table to talk about. I'll get my three. Please, I'm going to read. One place. Oh, yeah. Please. Hello. My name is Ernest Brooks. I'm an AMRS student, and uh, I'm particularly focused on social and political ethics and how questions of religion kind of interact with those areas. So this reading was particularly interesting to me to tailor a reflection. And this may be a really simplistic question, but I'm wondering how the engagement with a secular public um, requires us to redefine or to clarify what our definition of theology is. Um, and does the definition of theology matter um, for the theologian, depending on the publics that he or she is engaged in? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think it definitely does. Um, you know, personally, I wrestle with you know the classic definitions of theology as you know the study of God or conversations on the study of God, um, and how that definition of God and you know. Uh, being is expanded um, and the fact that in order to discuss those matters one need not cite scripture or need not cite revelation um, if you believe that the world is God's creation and all that there is therein then everything you talk about is in some sense theology whether it's art, music, science uh, but I do recognize that there's a tension there and then there, there's another question is if everything that you do is theology then why do we have this discrete discipline called theology with its particular theories and methods? 
We have the same problem with religion. If, if everything's religious, then why do you need religion? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a good question. You're right now with things. Um, there's no doubt that in public, the concept of theology has to be enlarged. Uh, sometimes it's just abandoned, uh, covered up with other words, good words. Religion could be a good word. Uh, in our culture, I'm not a member of the organized church. I hate religion. But I'm very spiritual. I'm picturing aerosol spray. No, that's not what people live by and die by and fight for and heal with. Uh, but you can't take for granted that any of our definitions work. Uh, I'm 2017 is coming up. And so there's another Lutheran celebration. I have to write some things about Luther. <laughs> And you can't get into that without getting into fights about what justification by faith means. Shoo, you go, Mars, there, wait a minute. You're all smarter than I am. I don't know more about than I do. But uh, I take great comfort from the fact if the word ends in A-T-I-O-N, that heritage is not preachable, not prayable, justification, propitiation, Transubstantiation. Creation. Creation. You can rescue creation. <laughs> you can rescue it, but you can't in the abstract. Yeah. The thing. Redemption. Yeah, they're all. They're all no, there's no way. There's no way. A T I O. Oh, oh. Come on now, are you kidding me? You won't get salvation. <laughs> <laughs> But all of them point to things that people care very much about. <laughs> very much. Uh, but I took comfort from Martin Luther who said, yeah, you know what, my whole business is justification, my grace through faith. But I never like to preach about it. <laughs> when I preach about it, the people start sleeping, visiting, leaving, etc. So I have to tell stories. Now the stories sometimes will be biblical stories. Usually it would be, I suppose, it start there, but they, all the way through, when you're doing Bernard, Clairvaux, I don't care who you're doing, when they wanted to get across to people, they would convert these to things, the language they're already used. And I think the assumption we have to use here is uh, the people we're trying to reach are not dumb. They're smart about other things. And Grant Wagner is our top historian of our generation. Was in town, he has a new biography on Billy Graham. And a uh, really good book. Well, uh, I once said, how do you, how do you communicate a mixed audience? Because he's really good at it. He was a uh, born a Pentecostal. And he's now fallen into being a Baptist, I think. Um, starts his book by saying, and all these admirers of Graham who won't like anything I criticize. And I always critic of Graham won't like anything I say. So my best advice is to myself. I got it from my grandmother. As she emerges on the expressway, she says, okay, fasten your seatbelt, close your eyes, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Uh, how do you do it? And, and he said, in any audience, mixed audience, when you're a specialist, you spend your time. When it's a mixed audience, uh, assume everybody there as smart as you are, but about something else. Mm -hmm. And you can translate so many of these things that don't work for you. Uh, justification by faith. Uh, he finally invented the notion that it means a joyful exchange. The things that God wants done, exchanges, you take a deeper fix of bad stuff, give us the good stuff. Well, anybody can understand that if you tell the stories that go with it. Uh, sanctification, holiness, boy, people hate them, they hate that. Until you take a model of somebody, I'm watching in Nepal. Why, why do people go over to help Nepal? Uh, something resonates among them, and something in their pre-training has led them to know how to do this. So, uh, again, the ATI-line words will never work. But what they're pointing to, I think, could be made very much alive. Uh, maybe even the, the basic metaphors that we have to take. Uh, 
Paul Tilley was right in it combine this Lutheranism with this modern socialism. And he said that when you read all these things about Luther's guilt and so on, you're reading with people who most of them don't feel guilt. Uh, you look at a suburban congregation, <laughs> doesn't have to be suburban. Uh, I just assume they wouldn't feel real guilty all the time. I'm not trying to get them out of that. But then how do you get them into a context in which the release comes? Uh, you're, you're right at the heart of what we're talking about. My, my wider audience would be, uh, in our culture, we just know it's plural. I love to hear the definitions that come out. We're members of the Lutheran Church on the North Side. In Chicago, almost half of all Lutheran marriages are Lutheran Catholic. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's it. Uh, I, pre <laughs> I preached for Martin Luther's 500th birthday. Cardinal Bird invited me in. And there were 440 Lutheran churches, and they all got four tickets. And we were ready to see clerical colors, terminal clerical colors. They, they gave them out to their members. And after the service, I was there all of There was murder in. People coming by, all crying. We couldn't go to our daughter's baptism because she's Lutheran and I'm Catholic. We couldn't go to our so-and-so marriage. We were young enough not to remember that. That's how it was not many years ago. And that all changed. That was a release that came along the way. And, and they, they get the story in a fresh way because they were living in that context. Uh, Vatican II did a good measure of getting them all the way, but it's true almost to history and a lot of things that we thought were done. I'm a historian, not throwing anything away, we never do, <laughs> but you have to polish it and present it in a new way. Awesome, something else. To follow up briefly on this, I'm, I'm very taken with the category of the story in your writing and how it, uh, it can be a way into discerning the contours of a public or the world that somebody uh, brings to bear on their, own, on their own work, their own life, the ways that they speak to each other. But I'm wondering about the limits of that. What, are the, what doesn't come across in somebody's story that you might still want to consider as an essential part of their world? Well, abstraction is very important in the world. You got a room full of scientists out there, and uh, they don't. They don't just go for a four, forty-five minute lecture on this. They don't know what was Einstein getting at, and that could be very abstract. I'm reading a review which pulls them into the story. Uh, no, no single mode. That's a, a word I like to use a lot. There's no single mode of communicating. Uh, Music, the jazz really communicates, baroque really communicates, and maybe connotative. Uh, if you if you know your Bach and so on, and your Monteverdi, and you move know, on from there, and it's sound key. Bach had some secular cantatas, horn as they come, coffee cantata, pesci cantata. <laughs> but that sounds sacred to me because it's the same kind of thing they've done along the way. Uh, no, I think the, the, we couldn't get anywhere without science, without abstraction. And I, I'm reading a book right now by Chris <coughs> Do you know her? She's, her been, you know? she's been here for a workshop. A workshop. I hope she communicated, because I would say she communicates. Okay. Christine Helmer teaches uh, Reformation. And I think that's right. Luther, right. Do you have a question? I'm reading a book of hers now. It's called The End of Doctrine. Mm -hmm. deliberately a pun. In the end, it's a defense of doctrine. But where does it come in? <clears throat> it wasn't the theory of Christians running around shouting doctrines. It's when they had an argument, when they told all the stories, when they had done all their politics, they had to finally come to something that brought it together. And we have to unpack it. Uh, at our church yesterday, we did the Nicene Creed. On one level, it's absolutely... <laughs> On, on Trinity Sunday, we even do the Athanasian Creed. <laughs> the Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, but this uncreate. You know, it's all there. Until you get a Robert Grant to tell you why it's there. And unpack it. And I think that a good communicator, how is Lutheranism explained in our, in our class? We have a fun class because we don't have a teacher. We just sit around. What does this text say to you? And she said, well, uh, I married this Lutheran, here I am, 
And all my relatives, what, what is, what's it like to be a Lutheran? Oh, Lutherans, that's the church where they sing all the verses of all the hymns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, isn't that a clue? It gives you a clue to what they're looking for. Uh, what does she do when she gets Luther shirts? They use the guitars and such stuff. Uh, I guess I'm really arguing every one of these is a teaching opportunity if you are concerned about who is the other and what are the terms on which you can begin to meet. Sometimes I wonder, too, if uh, abstractions uh, merge not only in relation to the relationship between stories and science, but when uh, the same story can be told or can be read in quite different ways. Uh, and certainly American history has that feature. I'm reading a book right now by Carl Copeland. He wasn't setting himself up for a book. <laughs> the, uh, what looks like it's going to be the same story yeah. is um, somebody else reads it and says, well, where are my people in this story? We were a part of it. We were a part of this, but not the way you told it. Read Tony Morrison's yeah. book and you get it yeah. right there. Okay. She does this always. Um, the favorite in our house among novelists right now is Marilyn Robinson. Mm -hmm. She's a Calvinist. Picture being a Calvinist, writing books as a Calvinist novelist. And she's explicitly so, mm -hmm. but it's always in story form. Anybody read her yet? Sure. It's your homework. Mm -hmm. uh, Gilead is the story of an old congregational minister. It's the form of a long letter he's writing to his son, born later in the man's life. And then home, but the new one is called Lila. I'll give you one quick sample. Lila is uh, trash. Literally found a pile of trash. Didn't know anything, didn't know anybody, didn't, couldn't read, anything like that. Somehow, by grit of will, her character is formed. Interesting character. And she comes to a little town in Iowa. It's not her town, her people, her anything about it. The minister one time. She, she went to get warm when you go to church. She spotted in the back row. Nobody else was paying attention, but she was. It must be something weird that somebody paying attention to my sermon. So they got acquainted, and pretty soon she starts uh, tending his garden. And as you get deeper in the novel, you really care about the two people. And one, one day he said, he said, you know, you're doing so much for me. He's a widower now. What are you doing? You're doing so much for me. What can I do for you? Marry me. <laughs> he did. And two worlds couldn't have been further apart coming together. And what you learn of uh, predestination, A T I O N, comes up in this there, but you don't recognize it, it's what's coming at you. Uh, I think African American fiction has done this more than anybody else. Uh, Ralph Ellison at the beginning and uh, in our own time, all over the place. Uh, I have to read the uh, Jewish literature about what is familiar to you. Uh, read the different ways in which the story of Abraham and Isaac sacrifice. It, it resides in Jewish stories, it resides in Christian teaching. It's a crucial story. If you think about it, it's about the most horrible story you could ever think of. And yet it gets interpreted into a new pattern. And it comes a lot of different ways. Uh, we had a friend who wrote a little oratorio, a Jewish composer in New England, Howard Tracy, in which, uh, I'm going to take the story for granted, there was an alder and wood in there ready for the fire. Where's the victim? And the father has his knife, and the little boy thinks it's a game they're playing. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, okay, you're going to have the victim. You're the victim. Uh, you're going to try a different pattern. Chosenness. Uh, we take that for granted. That's the root of all the strengths and all the problems in the Middle East and where it's all about. Chosenness. Think of the different ways Jews treat chosenness. Uh, one said, well, you know, 
is most exalted thing about all the above all the nations to be chosen, all the main things to happen. But God, next time you're going to choose, would you please choose somebody else? <laughs> because the implication of being chosen was a response of a covenant, and that was pretty touching. So uh, at the wider publics, I think they uh, they're out there. Uh, they're not going to come running unless you play. I see uh, Miriam Renault here, my my editor. Mm -hmm. Today, I know, short, okay, 600 words, 800 words? Five to 600 words. She's pretty crabby, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in which I just can't get over how often in the last couple of weeks I've been reading things in the culture called secular. They use the word race. By the way, I even read the uh, Brooks, David Brooks. Mm -hmm. His new book on character is explicitly, in fact, he even has a line there, in the end we are saved by grace. Huh. It's a secular interpretation. He's not trying to smoke himself into the orthodoxy, and yet there's no substitute for what he's talking about when he gets to it. Grace. Uh, I put four or five of these together. There, there they were. And, uh, People know the song Amazing Grace, so it's in the vocabulary, but that can be pretty stereotyped too along the way. Uh, these novels I've mentioned, Marilyn Robinson, uh, explicitly grace is there. Uh, the full life is what they're all after if they're good novelists, and if they are, they deal with the up and down of that. And the wider public will understand that, I think. Please. Polarization. You would remember the other half. <laughs> <laughs> um, both presumes separable worlds, or at least worlds that are constructed as separate and separable. Um, and your model is resisting even the premise of that, that there are possibilities, strategies, moments, et cetera, of convergences of worlds. And I'd love to hear further whether you think there are some conversations that just can't happen. In other words, that there really are polarizations that um, are intractable. And then even harder, I guess, is, is it worse now in American culture in terms of our public conversations wherever they take place than it was, say, 30, 40 years ago in terms of polarization. As I think is a kind of popular conception that things are as bad or worse than they've ever been in terms of polarization. And, you know, that's a, that's a, a hot air balloon for a historian to shoot at. More soft. Things are as good as they never were. Four centuries. Oh, you know. uh, but nonetheless, a uh, perception no. of both polarization and forms of institutionalization um, and of really media segregation that are more formidable even than they've been in the past that reinforce. I have a hunch you could quantify that it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you could do so in part by noticing the evaporation of the kinds of media that would bring them. When I mentioned David Brooks, for example, we never miss David Brooks and, Bro and Mark Shields on the uh, They're on Friday nights, I think. Mm -hmm. right? And I can't think of anybody else that's doing it. They are sitting, almost everything you see, there are two little boxes or four little boxes, people, one's in Boston, one's in San Antonio, they never see each other, and they, get, and they shower at each other, they shout, and they know they're getting applause from one fourth or mm -hmm. their fox. Mm -hmm. But uh, Rose and Shield, watch them. They're, they're on the same table next to each other, and like, well, I never thought of that before, or well, that's a good idea, I'll work on that. That doesn't happen where polarization has been Possibly. And we're in a culture, I think it would prove that that is the intention. Uh, that's where the money is. Uh, I did my internship when they finally let me in Washington, D.C. in the 50s. And uh, there were nine uh, 
theological interns who were aware of each other. And every Tuesday was our day off, and we would meet, and we had lunch, and then we would go to the Senate, U.S. Senate, <coughs> to hear debates, intense debates. Robert Taft versus Paul Douglas, pure conservative, pure liberal. Uh, Margaret Chase Smith and Estes Keefauver, I could go down the list of them, I knew them all. We were there every week, we wouldn't miss it. Because they, it was life and death stuff, Korean War issues. Oh man, the, the week that uh, who fired MacArthur. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, momentary. We we were we had appointments with we were we were lobbying for a uh, selective conscience objection bill, and we had appointments with all these senators. And they half of them were scared so many the other. We were in uh, Hickenlooper, hmm. Michigan. Mm-hmm. His desk was filed with a, a, a telegram. That's a yellow piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> you see a form of communication. And look, there was a president of peace to throw up there, throw up there. We had a member of our parish, Congressman Hook, a pro labor guy from Michigan, who got into a physical fight with uh, a Mississippi Baptist racist. Physical fight on the floor of the house. You could probably look it up in the congressional record on <clears throat> Friday. Sunday morning, the Baptist minister, the Lutheran minister, and their wives had these two congressmen and their wives at the table say, tomorrow you've got to go back and do the nation's business. You cannot do it the way you left it. And they were different because of it. So there were, I think that the, the big group, I was always trying to rewrite everything I did. That's what I brought for a divorce money in here. I think in some sense, this all changes, not with the internet, but with social media. Uh, I, I can still find my way around it. You know, things that this guy heard in a cartoon. But social media, uh, did anybody watch the, uh, the dinner the other night, the uh, White House dinner for the Congress? <laughs> uh, yeah. Entertaining. You know what they're going to say or have to say. They, know what the boundaries aren't and who would have come across them. But uh, all the way through, they're running a little line on what's, what's scoring in the public. Mm-hmm. You can see. Uh, Bill Moyers told us, for example, of a company that uh, pays thousands of people to watch all this and instantly vote. Fox News gets an instant vote and says, 30 seconds after the 83% of the American people don't like this, sir. 94% of the American people don't. No, they don't. That's it. And I don't think that instrumentality was quite that good with it. Uh, so I think money and instrumentality can make it worse. But I don't think it's fair. And you see moments where people risk, probably not on the level of the Senate and the House, but uh, look at the sample of how, uh, how I picture doing it differently. <coughs> I think part of the agenda today was to talk a bit about conversation as opposed to argument. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm invited to a uh, school board town meeting and they're debating uh, school vouchers, and it's very hot topics because at that time when I was doing this, it really meant our broken schools were going to get some money out of this. And so they were violent, violent opposition. Well, I would always say, I could go into that room tonight and say, uh, come tonight to defend uh, school vouchers. 51% of the people were with me already. I didn't need it. 49% weren't going to pay attention. If I would go in that room and say, American public schools are in trouble, can we leave this room tonight with five fresh ideas for improving public education. It's all over the place. They all have ideas. <laughs> Two days ago, I saw a, a, a teacher who said on TV, finish this sentence. I wish my teacher knew this about me. Finish the sentence. One, I'm always scared. One, they all pick on me. 
not in words like that. And it just made it possible for her to minister to these kids in a new way. Uh, but you're still on a petite level. And when you get to the highest, uh, hardest level, uh, I don't have an answer. I don't allow myself to be a pessimist, but I, I, I tell the truth. Sorry. Only because I heard it on the radio today. I didn't know I was going to have to pass a test on it, otherwise I could give the information more accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, a respected study just came out today, uh, it came out and reported today that some scholar has come to the conclusion, yes, it is worse today than throughout the United States history. And he said part of the reason is that the new phenomenon is that we no longer vote for someone, we vote against someone. And we do that because we hate the other side. That's the big difference. Uh, I understand so, where you come from on that. I can't say it. I, 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 we did have a civil war. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but, and there was still some commonality according to this study, as opposed to, well, sure, they killed, brothers killed each other, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> That's not civil. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I do know it was the war between the, uh, uh, of northern aggression. Yeah. Sorry. And war between the states. No, yeah. there were always humane gestures. There were wonderful people that uh, did wonderful things. But as a national cause, you you, you couldn't duck. Um, I think that uh, before 1954, I'm not all that high yet about it, but in 1954, it was that way with uh, race, uh, intermarriage, uh, public education. I, I mean, 54, because public education, I think, is really the beginning of any kind of term. We may have a long way to go, but you now have instrumentalities in which it goes on. Just one for The difference might be, I'm doing this not because I hate you, it's because I think you're wrong. And I think that's different. I hate you, and therefore, that's all I need to know. As long as you have the liberty to define the other, you're going to do it that way. Uh, and I don't know if it's part of one of these books, like Tourism versus Tribalism. Uh, and in, in Tribalism, when Scott Appleby and I were doing the study of military fundamentals around the world, we always quoted a scholar who said, Exactly. Around the world, there is a massive, convulsive ingathering of peoples into their separatenesses and over against us to protect their pride and power of place from the other who is doing the same. Yeah. And uh, we were trying to analyze, for example, why did fundamentalism get invented in the 1920s? They won't find a word in a dictionary before that. We didn't know what a fundamental was, but you didn't have fundamentalism. 1925, you had the Scopes trial, the best known, if not fully represented thing, uh, from about evolution. This is the one the public considers the birth of it. Actually, we, the first time you spot it was in a, in a Baptist magazine in 1920. Everybody in our denomination wants to be cons called conservative, but they don't stand for things. We want to. Uh, uh, Meanwhile, in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, 1925. Uh, India, RSS and uh, BJP, 1925. We all think of your people as humane, gentle, reconciling. Boy, they got that all of a sudden. And uh, the best clue that our better experts, who I don't know if they thought this, was that uh, radio was a big part. Uh, all of a sudden, instead of just being a little hillbilly preacher on one side of the hill in Tennessee, he didn't know the other side of the hill, all of a sudden you have a radio station in Del Rio, Texas, that comes everywhere with that homogenizing message. So I think that that, uh, it's so hard to say it wasn't that before. To create, to, to create islands of safety, again, when I said I'm not optimistic about what you just asked me before, uh, I don't give up on the American uh, effort. I think a lot of things happen. A plug for our business. I think uh, state universities, for example, uh, 
have to be very careful about Islam, Judaism, or whatever. Why are they careful? Uh, not because they woke up that morning loving everybody, but they knew that there are no boundaries, and the boundaries exist so that you can find a new vocabulary for dealing with each other along the way. And I think that's happened in many places. I've spoken at state universities all over, uh, and if there's a center for this, sometimes it's a worship center. Uh, but often the worship is thinned out so much that it isn't worship, it's just sort of a, a place to gather. Uh, whereas here you can get substituted into it. Man, what's her name? What I was reading, uh, I'm on her side, whatever's her name. What's her name? I am your Sally, it's Somalian. Are you talking about Somalian uh, former Muslim woman, I am your Sally? Where was she from? She was she went to she was a Muslim yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and she's a best seller and she's on T V and her argument is very simple. Uh, the problem with Islam is <coughs> the Prophet and the Quran. And if you just get rid of that, then Muslims would be all right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, anybody is on, you know, that Matt is to them or Jesus is to the Christian. No, you're the Christian, you're the Christian. I was uh, disturbed to see that uh, the, I think the Power Tribune is going to have seven lectures that you can buy into and she's going to be in town. Well, uh, how did she get there? Mark Shaler, Putting him around here now. And Mark Shaler made a study of apostasy. You form a group, you define the other, you define who's in, who's out, and then you leave. Uh, when I first started teaching here, we started getting our first Southern Baptist. Uh, I was a Southern Baptist in Texas, and now I'm a left wing Unitarian. I said, you know, that's really wonderful, but there are two stops along the way. <laughs> you don't have to. What, is, what did Mark Shader say? The apostate spends his or her whole subsequent career taking revenge on their own spiritual past. And that's... I've been invited by two publishers to write a memoir, which I promise you I will never do. <laughs> Somebody who's assigned a watch that I don't. <laughs> and my brother is a fellow historian. Said, well, if you start writing a memoir, I'm just going to come and tear it up. Why? Well, every... Uh, we generalize a bit. Every memoir by an adult male spends the first third of the book fighting father. Well, Freud can do all his lessons right there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I work with friends of Norman Lear, and he would autobiography reads a memoir. Uh, a lot of fun, funniness and cheer. Always oh, busy with his dad though. Oh man. Oh. <laughs> of course he makes it kind of fun. Uh, his father was a Russian Jew, came to America, and every week on the right letter President Roosevelt. <laughs> they could all take courses on how to write portrait letters, because they came over single, now the women are coming in. How do you and Every letter he writes, he rolls up, my dearest darling President Roosevelt. <laughs> but bringing humor into it, which is what he did with all the family, uh, lightens it. I, I think uh, humor, I think art, art is a great instrument for breaking down the barriers. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do it. But when you're defining the tribe, you get to assign what the other one is and you give them all the bad features and they don't have the chance to escape. And they're doing it to you. I think just briefly follow this up with looking at some of these challenges in the context of the classroom. Um, it seems like much of the polarization that's active at the, in the political order is going to be echoed in student perspectives. Um, it's going to find ways of playing out in classes. Um, I think some of, some of what you find in the political order, people simply choosing not to participate in conversation, exempting themselves from the sorts of um, interactions you would classify as conversation, can be surmounted in the classroom simply by expecting a certain kind of participation. At the same time, are there conversations, I mean, here's, here's the Dean's questions again, are there conversations that can't happen or perhaps shouldn't happen um, 
where the classroom is concerned. I think they can all happen. It's how they happen is the mm -hmm. issue. Uh, there's a good literature now, and a lot of good examples. I think the one that state universities, uh, I'm, I'm using the word state, private there too, but in state, uh, taxpayers will say we're captain. Yeah, so I'll call it state universities. Um, most of them are about uh, critical criticism. Often evolution, but that's, that's just so there. Whereas biblical criticism is potentially interesting because you have to get into uh, what's the oldest gospel right and the Paul Wright and the Gospels in there. That's really interesting stuff. And you could get a class involved. Now, if you come in the first day and say, um, oh, boy, you're dumb, stupid. Presbyterian minister taught you all this stuff. We're going to part airman style. Take <laughs> your revenge on its own spiritual past. And so the That was terrible. <laughs> Starting over. <laughs> but, but, it, it, but it explains the, the thing wrong way. I think it's exciting when people find why it's important to you to know that. What new insights you get. They don't all have to come out to where you do. A lot of can become like that because they're faster, but they're going to be different with it. And uh, any good teacher of the Bible is, is opening people's eyes to so many things that are there. That, they thought it was kind of boring. Uh, we had, uh, do people still read Van Harvey? He had a book, uh, The Story of the Believer. And he taught at Penn. Superstar, he was the lead guy. But he, he said, I'm kind of, I've said it all, labor and all, I'm getting tired of boring graduate students. And, uh, he had a great friend, Bill Klepsch, a cynical, sardonic uh, historian of religion. I use only physical past. <laughs> uh, he said, well, then, why don't you come to Stanford? I can get you nominated, and I think I'm influencing the committee, and you're a superstar. Stanford would be glad to have you. So we resigned. They kind of moved and moved to Palo Alto and all the wonders of that. And after a couple of weeks, he said, uh, boy, did I make a mistake. He said, why? Oh, I'm just bombing. Nothing. He told me these kids are smart. They don't care a bit. They don't nothing. Bill said, can I visit your class? Mm. Yeah. So he did. Bill said, can I come back next time? <laughs> yes. Here's the di my diagnosis. You are telling me what Van Harvey thinks of what Ernst Fuchs thinks of what Boltman thinks of what Heidegger thinks of what Pascal thought of what Luther thought of what Paul thought of what Jesus and they have the faintest idea of who Jesus is. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, uh, uh, the second time, before uh, they said, let's have a test. They picked 14 proper nouns out of the Bible and they told the students this counts. It's kind of cheating because it doesn't count because they didn't know his assignment. But they knew not to write smart ass answers. <laughs> Jesus was there. They all knew Jesus. The whole class. Uh, they knew Mary. They got confused because they're two Josephs, and that was their problem. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and they're thinned off from there on. And that's why Clef said, Now, without your permission, Professor Harvey, Class will not meet for the next two weeks. I want you all to go home, and you have to have read the whole book, and there will be a test on it. You know, all professorial ethics are gone, but if you know those two guys, it doesn't bother them. The students came back and said, Man, I said, Oh, that's a goddamn interesting book. And, Man, oh, I mean, oh, everybody loves it. Everybody hates it. Everybody. <laughs> Why didn't they tell us that's in this book? Yeah. And I think what's Good teachers of Bible and state universities now know as to how to unlock that, as they do with Hebrew scriptures, as they do with uh, uh, your world. You get persecuted for it. Yes. <laughs> you <thought you're> <laughs> yeah, please. Hi, Professor Ari. Uh, my name is Adam Alon from the uh, Business School. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to take issue with one thing you said. Uh, I believe you, you said uh, in 
context of larger discussion about being careful at state universities <coughs> about what uh, about what one may assert of these of the uh, Middle East, for example. I would I would uh, I would suggest that, that one had one would find the same one would find the same dynamic um, yeah. at any university yeah. right here, uh, and that the state the government. Um, that the state, that some of that, that uh, form of secularism um, is deeply embedded in the university system, regardless of whether it's a state university institution. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a question or proposal. I happened to uh, pull out the bookshelf of uh, Harvey Cox last night, mm -hmm. on the secular city, I'm mm -hmm. sure one here tried. And um, he, had a, uh, he has a new book out on, um, or fairly new, um, The Future of Faith, I think it's called. And he broke up. Um, the religions, I think he was primarily thinking about Catholicism, in the three phases of the earliest uh, uh, faith, um, the second belief with the institutionalization um, of the church, for example, the bishop regime, and then lastly today, which he called perhaps an age of spirituality, um, being um, an expression of people's uh, confusion, uh, anger with uh, uh, many things that are wrong in the world. And I was thinking about um, this the thesis here for today, which is about uh, um, how to uh, have perhaps more success in expressing various viewpoints that I'm assuming like graduate students will, will uh, see in their careers um, in the media, which is difficult to penetrate. I write regularly in the major press on, on a number of different issues. And uh, I'm wondering if the, the notion of writing uh, uh, from a religious perspective is one now that's best expressed um, as one that um, challenges authority, challenges the state. Um, the global war on terror, for example, is kind of the new religion of uh, America right now. It has profoundly uh, disturbing um, impacts on the way that adults are being indoctrinated, for example. Uh, the law school has several well-known professors that join various government commissions to ratify state narratives. So I'm wondering if uh, perhaps the divinity school and then people that are undertaking this profession uh, her best um, focus on speaking truth's power, for example, and challenging the state. Well, that's what it got me for. Uh, I think I'm getting at your point. Uh, the hardcore, hardened secularism, which is habitual or sometimes legally backed, uh, and some some illegally backing is, is good. I mean, I, I'm all for that. You can't just do anything you want in the name of religion. Uh, but again, how do you do it? I think there's latency in faculties where they can do other things. <laughs> Again, <coughs> not BC, AD, AD, coming in early after Christ, University of Illinois was debating whether they should have a religious studies department. Way back. And I was to be an uh, <laughs> expert witness who could trade out of champagne. And uh, they were really disturbed because religion was getting very popular among the students. There was a Catholic priest um, retired three years ago. Oh, I forget his name. Colorful guy. And he had a big following. And uh, in those days, in Illinois, you had religion, half credit, taught by the uh, chaplains in a separate place, which wasn't the way to get them to be who they were and or to get a credential. So now they're get, getting to a point of trouble have a factor. And uh, when I see how or how, or how long ago that was, uh, on the train that morning I read beginning with Bill Buckley was running for mayor of New York. And what was that controversial because he was so explicitly Catholic. So I just paged around the New York Times, and that day I found 18 different stories that you couldn't really make sense of if you didn't know something about the religion. To be, I think you could make the case we would never fought the Iran Iraq War if we know a different piece of shit and Sunni. When we started the, uh, fundament the fundamental project, I should mention, was an American Academy of Arts and Sciences, kind of big grand and that's just a six volume study of this. And my colleague, uh, Scott Appleby, who now triumphs in Notre Dame, you know what he's doing in Notre Dame? Mm -hmm. He got a hundred million dollars to spend to start the first new school in a century. They've had school of law, school of medicine, school of, now they're going to have a school of global affairs, mm -hmm. stressing the humanistic dimension. And he gets to 
being in a, a plenty of 36 faculty. Well, when, when, I, when I got this thing, I, I remember I was a fanatic. I would never miss class. <laughs> so I said, I can't do this project. You've got to go to India. You've got to do all this stuff. Well, get somebody. And I, one of our recent alums was teaching at St. Xavier, Scott Appleby. Um, we come and she did it, one assistant. From our little office here, we had 200 scholars working. It was really a really wonderful web of all that stuff. How did they, they, uh, they had a $3 million dollar grant from the MacArthur Foundation that the American Academy could use for anything it wanted, as long as it was international, interdisciplinary, and uh, had a public impact. And they, they went through a lot of these things. Uh, Edward Levy was president of the university and president of the academy. <laughs> he told me about this way. Back, uh, a committee of 17 were debating this thing. It's not, the, not long after the Iran and Iraq war, and we were all trying to figure out something about why did that happen? How did we get Dr. President Carter over it? And then the, the academy meets in New England, and they'd never been a Protestant fundamentalist. Uh, but Gary Falwell was on television, so we could learn about it quickly. Fortunately, Nancy Emmerman, a good socialist of religion, wrote a wonderful book about doing the sort of one of the best books there have been yet. No, I don't believe it. Sixteen of the seventeen on that committee said, boy, that would be a good study. You got all the disciplines together there. You obviously have public impact and you're fighting about this all over the place. One guy said, no, uh, you're not going to do that. So they, they, they stalemated, and then uh, he went back and tried to defend that in his own faculty, and he wasn't making a time along the way, because they were all talking about these things. And uh, so we passed. He finally, uh, damn it, I'll vote for it. This is my voting. <laughs> <laughs> And that will be starts out February 4th, 1979. I have another memorized sentence on issues and answers. The head of the CIA, Admiral Stansfield Turner, was asked, how could the CIA have missed this revolution in Iran? He said, well, we, we're on top of everything. We knew exactly what the women wore. We knew divorce. We knew uh, university. We knew pop music. The only thing we paid no attention to at all was religion, because everybody knows religion has no power in the modern world. Half of you came in about the other day and said, you know, I gave a lecture at the War College last week, and I'm meeting Colin Powell next week, and uh, I'll tell you, the State Department has gotten religion today. <laughs> well, that's a good way of getting at it. I'm just saying there are hidden discontents and you have to work around the way people are seeing them. Uh, humor often does it. And, uh, and you can mess it up. Faculty can mess it up, too. Uh, religion pops can mess it up. Um, I remember one of our grads was teaching at Stowar. Yeah. And everybody in the room was, you know, pads and so on. He spent the whole first year learning them till they respected him, and he knew why it was important to them. Because I don't want to make fun of them. They're living full lives. But you're right. When it gets to be formal, it's, it's hard. It's hard for new cars. Are we time for a last question? Um, so you started to talk about the, um, the sort of polarization that we're seeing uh, these days as um, not as a sort of sociological divisions, um, uh, so, but but more, um, uh, you know, the kind of thing that is encouraged by the limitations of the kinds of media that we're using. The kind of thing that just sort of, you know, um, uh, you have 140 characters to make your point, and then everyone else gets <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. This kind of thing, um, and now it seems to me, on the other hand, that we. Um, in the academy, that scholars um, are sort of our universal specialization is something like nuance, um, uh, something like um, making distinctions, not not doing the thumbs up, thumbs down thing, but you know, going a little deeper. And and um, and, um, and I just and I, and so so on the one hand, that's we scholars are a solution to 
the kind of polarization that we're seeing. On the other hand, that's a problem. We have a problem because there's there's a there's sort of a language culture divide there. Um, and you know, it worst and I mean, I I see it, and and I I feel like I see it um, even in you know uh, before we get to Twitter. I'm just just in talking to to people who were who were not um, acculturated into this kind of thing. And, and so, you know, people's eyes glaze over. I'm sure we've all had this experience. We start talking about our specialization, people's eyes glaze over, and they're, wait, no, okay, wait a minute. Just tell me, just answer my question, please, right? So, um, I, mean, if, if, I mean, if I would submit that this is very much uh, what has gotten you into so much trouble, Professor Doniger. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, Professor Doniger has written a delightful, a del a, 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 an easy read, really, a very delightful read. That is 700 pages long. The people who, who, you know, people, you don't have to have a graduate degree to read it. People that have, that have, ta that had the time to get through it, um, and and the, and the will to get through it, enjoy it. It's accessible. But uh, then a lot, of, a lot of people didn't, and the nuance, and, and and if they understood the nuance, it wouldn't have found the pulse. But but you know, but it gets taken to say something completely different. So, sorry. So the my question is, how do we? Um, Bridge that communicative divide. How do we how do we talk um, in a way that it can be heard, but in a way that we're not also losing our scholarly principles, our message. I think I said before that's the one thing I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you do pretty well. I'm <laughs> encourage you. I would think that just as the people in that early Paul Rowe era had to learn what was, why was why did he be at the kind of power it did. And out of some national event and out of the Manning and stuff, so forth in PBS and all these other places where you've got alternatives coming up, uh, I think a coming generation should take on not the internet and such, that's not a problem. It was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Just today, on my thing came up. I forget who, who wrote it. On the future, can history survive? You know, when the, the, the Chinese satellite and our satellite and everything electronic is gone, all records are gone. Uh, I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> uh, you know. There are apocalyptic versions of these things, and I, I'm not going to duck them. But I think there are, on many other levels, there are things that we could do along the way, and that's what civilizations have done along the way. Uh, they, uh, <clears throat> the modification of the world, the of the world, and the system of conviction of the preceding generation, are a situation which were without the convictions and therefore without a world. Um, I think a new world is being fashioned in some way, not, not in a single piece. As a, as a say, it's one piece either. But uh, I hope you think about that. I, I did a comment a couple of weeks ago, bear me, uh, robots and algorithms getting so advanced that the human factor just about to go out of it. And everybody stops short by saying, only one more step, artificial intelligence. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe it'll all be over, I don't know. But I think that uh, our calling is to make sense of the world in which we are. And uh, I would take uh, the students that are not confined to this and uh, show them the Lord reading a whole long eight-page essay someday. Uh, I meet a lot of young people that didn't know they would get interested they got interested. And it's almost always because of uh, imaginative and patient teachers uh, who supplemented them with many music and art and experience. Uh, but the collecting, the, I just, I can't get over how often I hear good stories about somebody who got something going somewhere. Uh, often beginning with a story, but it can't end with a story. So I wouldn't get discouraged. I would say, uh, you go for broke, and I will go for broke. Well, Professor Martin makes the point that uh, argument seeks to come to conclusions, but conversation is open-ended. Mm -hmm. Conversation will continue over food and wine. It's a lovely reception. Many thanks again to Mark Marty Center for supporting this event, and most special thanks to Professor Mark Marty. Thank you.
We thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.